Listen to this very powerful narration from Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu anhu. It's narrated by Al-Baghawi. It's a beautiful statement, but it's scary too. Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala anhu says, إِنَّ الْعَبْدَ لَيْهَمُّ بِالْأَمْرِ مِنَ الْإِمَارَةِ أَوْ التِّجَارَةِ A person, the servant of Allah, starts to desire something of this world from tijara or imara, meaning from, uh, from fame or leadership or wealth, either fame or money, starts to desire it. Hatta yuyassara lahu. Until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decrees it for that person. It's been made open to that person. It is coming to that person. فَيَنظُرُ إِلَيْهِ سُبْحَانَهُ وَتَعَالَ مِنْ فَوْقِ سَبْعِ سَمَوَاتِ Then Allah looks at him from above seven heavens. Allah sees his servant. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala يَقُولُ لِلْمَلَائِكَةِ Allah says to the angels أَصْرِفُوهُ عَنْهِ Take that blessing away from him. You imagine it's on its way to you. The risk is on its way to you. The sustenance is on its way. You're about to get exactly what you want. You're getting the person that you wanted. You're getting the wealth that you wanted. You're getting the position that you wanted. It's on its way to you. And the angels are bringing it down to you. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala looks at you from above seven heavens and says, Asrifuhu an, Take it away from that person. Why? Did that person do anything wrong? What did they do, Ya Allah? To have that risk essentially intercepted. What did they do, Ya Allah? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, because if I give it to that person, I will have to throw that person into hellfire. Why? Because they will change. And it will divert them away from Allah. And Allah would rather keep you pure so that you enter into Jannah than give you what you want in this world so that you end up in hellfire. So the person, that servant continues to say after that, oh, he beat me to it, she beat me to it. They, they got this, they got that. Why me? Why me? And it is nothing but the blessing of Allah on that person that Allah held it back from you. Allah knows you. Allah knows what ails you. Allah knows what cures you. Allah knows what renews you. Allah knows what destroys you. Allah knows his creation. Allah knows all your fine-tuning, the stuff that people don't see. The person that you really are, beyond the appearance that you give in public. Allah knows you. You are who you are in the dark. That's who Allah knows. Allah knows your thoughts, your inner workings. How certain, th certain things will affect you. How certain things will move you in different directions. SubhanAllah, Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala anhu. I, I just thought of this actually, SubhanAllah. Allahu Akbar. When he was passing away, Uthman radiallahu anhu came into him when he was sick. This just shows you how these people internalize what they say. Ibn Mas'ud was sick. And Uthman radiallahu anhu saw him dying of his sickness. Uthman radiallahu anhu said, Aati laka bi tabib. Should I go get you a doctor? Qal, at-tabibu amradani. He said, the doctor is the one who made me sick. That doesn't mean don't get medical help. That means Ibn Mas'ud understood these were his last moments. And he said, I'm pleased with the qadr of Allah. I'm pleased with the decree of Allah here. Allah knows his servants. And Allah knows what to give you and what to withhold from you. And the Prophet ﷺ gives us this, this image, an authentic hadith. He says, alayhi salatu wasalam, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala withholds the dunya from his servant the way that one of you would withhold water from someone who's very ill. What he meant by that, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, yahmi saqimahu min al-ma. There are some sicknesses where water, cold water, would not be good for you. But it would feel good, but it won't be good for you. There's a difference between the two, right? Something might feel good, but it's bad for you. Okay? So it would feel relieving, but it's actually hurting you. I remember when, when my wife was in delivery, with uh, the first uh, child and sisters, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you. Uh, we men couldn't do it. <laughs> I'll just, I know I couldn't. And that's why Jannah is under your, your, your feet, truly, subhanAllah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward uh, all of our sisters. I was, and none of the brothers said, I mean, they were like, oh, we can do that. I could get pregnant, I could have a kid. Piece of cake. I remember when my wife was delivering uh, our our first child, 
and uh, as she was getting close, uh, she, the doctor told her she couldn't drink water close to the operation. And the, they'd give her a little bit of ice to chew on. And the nurse said, no water. And my wife looked at me, and she gave me the look. And she said, I want water. And I looked at the nurse, and the nurse said, she can't have water. My wife is looking at me like, who are you going to listen to, the nurse or me? And I, I was thinking of this hadith, subhanAllah, that sometimes a person wants something so bad, and you have to withhold it from them out of love for them. Allah does that with you. Not because he wants to punish you. Not because he, it's out of vengeance. Not because you know he wants to torture you and wants you to feel hurt. Allah wants to break your addiction to dunya. You know, when you have a drug addict, it's irresponsible to keep feeding them the drug to keep them happy. You need to learn to live irrespective of your circumstances. Your connection of Allah has to mature to a place where it doesn't matter what's happening with you. And Ibn al-Qayyim says that the ahwal are always changing. You know why? He said so that Allah can constantly teach you that this dunya, this world, is not a place of istiqrar. It's not a place of stability. This world is not meant to be a place where you find stability. This world is meant to be a place of instability to show you that you should not pursue stability in a place where stability is impossible. That doesn't mean you don't do well with your work. That doesn't mean you don't do well with your relationships. That doesn't mean you don't pursue the best of this world and ask Allah for the best of this world. But your expectation of this dunya has to change. Your expectation of what you get from this world has to change. And your relationship with Allah has to be consistent. The one thing, Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah said, the one thing that's worse than death is losing your connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The one thing that has to be able to, to persist throughout all of that is your connection to Allah. وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يَعْبُدُ اللَّهَ عَلَى حَرْفِ Allah says some people worship Allah on an, on an edge, literally a cliff. <laughs> They're always on a cliff. If good things happen, they say, okay, we'll pray and we'll be good Muslims and we'll go to lectures. The minute something bad happens to them, they jump off the cliff with their iman. Allah says in Surah Al-Fajr, as for Al-Insan, وَمَا سُمِّيَ الْإِنسَانِ إِلَّا لِنَسْيِهِ you're, you're named insan because you always forget. When Allah tests you by blessing you, yes, مَبْتَلَاهُ فَأَكْرَمَهُ وَنَعْمَ Allah tests you by blessing you. And Ata says, الْإِبْتِلَاءُ بِالنَّعِيمُ أَقْصَى وَأَشَدْ مِنَ الْإِبْتِلَاءُ بِالضِيقِ وَالْفَقْرِ To be tested with ease is much more difficult than being tested with hardship and poverty. Why? Because at least the one who's in poverty recognizes something is wrong. When everything is good, you don't recognize that anything is wrong. You don't recognize it as a test. So when a person's in that state, he says, Rabbi Akraman, my Lord honored me. He doesn't say that out of gratitude. This isn't, وَأَمَّا بِنِعْمَةِ رَبِّكَ فَحَدِّثْ Which is to say, Alhamdulillah, when good things happen to you. This is to essentially justify your position, justify your position and justify everything you're doing in life and say, look, Allah loves me or else he wouldn't give me all of this. So you're doing a lot of haram, but you're not facing consequences in this world? You say, well, God must love me. Allah must love me because if he didn't love me, then lightning bolts would be striking me right now. My house would be burning down. I wouldn't have any money in the bank account. We equate prosperity in this life with the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is the opposite of <laughs> what the Prophet ﷺ taught us. We don't believe in the prosperity doctrine. We believe in something deeper than that. So this person says, Rabbi Akraman, look, Allah loves me. Then Allah tests that person and Allah just restricts, restricts their wealth. Not demolishes it. It doesn't all tank. It doesn't all go down the drain. Allah just takes a little bit away from it. فَيَقُولُ رَبِّي أَهَانًا And that person looks to Allah and says, My Lord is humiliating me. Why me? Why is God doing this to me? 
You know, subhanAllah, I, 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 don't, I don't make this up. I actually had a brother one time in my office who was losing faith. Why? He said, he said you know, and he was very wealthy. It was weird. I mean, he drove like a really nice car and everything was great in his life. He said that every year I take my children on a vacation to Europe. And this year I can't do it. And he's angry with Allah because he doesn't have enough money to take his kids on a vacation to Europe this year. And that's like the biggest disaster in his life. And you know what, subhanAllah, as silly as that sounds, you know when we start having the faith crisis? Not when we see hardship happening to people around the world, but when we get pinched and we say, why me? Why is God doing this to me? You know, you weren't bothered when 600 people died in Syria on one day. astaghfirullah, may Allah give them victory. But when you didn't get into medical school or you didn't get that promotion that you wanted or you didn't get that person that you wanted, why is Allah doing this to me? Meaning what? We don't actually care as people whether or not life is fair. We just want it to be unfair for us. As long as it's unfair in my favor, I'm good. Alhamdulillah, I'll pray and I'll do everything. I'll be the best Muslim in the world. Once it starts to t turn a little bit on us, and the ahwal start to change, suddenly, why does Allah do this? Now I'm concerned about, why do, why do bad things happen to good people? And what you mean by when you say, why do bad things happen to good people? You mean, I'm good, why did this bad thing happen to me? And just so I don't look like a narcissistic, you know, selfish person, I'm going to project this on the entire world and say, why are bad things happening to good people when all I really care about is, why is this bad thing happening to me? Right? We internalize things in a very greedy way. And your relationship with Allah has to be different. You have to have that trust and that consistency in your relationship with Allah. That I will worship you in good times and bad times. The Prophet says as Ramadan is coming up, he says, alayhi salatu wasalam, al-ta'imu shakir bi manzilat islam as sabr the one who eats and says alhamdulillah is just like the one who fasts and is patient. Meaning what? It's about your recognizing your vulnerability in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if when you're eating your good food, and mashallah you guys have a lot of good food here, all right? You're eating your good food, and at the end of it you say alhamdulillah alladhi at'amani hadha min ghayri hawlin minni wa la quwwa. All praises be to Allah who fed me this and provided it to me. I didn't do anything to deserve this. This wasn't me. This was all Allah. And you say it with such profound belief. Like it's not like, Alhamdulillah, where's the shy? Where's the tea? It's Alhamdulillah alladhi at'amani hadha wa razaqni min ghayri hawla minni wa laquwa. Ya Allah, thank you. <laughs> I didn't deserve this. <laughs>